you know, last week we started talking about the tabernacle and, and uh, really everything you get into with the tabernacle. And we kind of stated that the idea, you know, you can get so caught up in just all the minutia of the tabernacle that you can kind of lose sight of what it was there for. You know, I mean, we, it's, it's neat to look at all the different word pictures and look at all the different things that, that are just revealed to us and how in every aspect and every little point has a purpose. And it's not a bad thing to look at these things and to study these things, but sometimes we can't see the forest for the trees. And so, you know, it, when you start studying, it's kind of like when you uh, study scripture or study Hebrew, you can break it down letter by letter by letter by letter. But in doing that, you lose focus of the context of the whole book. So, you know, you got to keep everything in its full context as to we see what we're looking at. And so tonight we want to continue, you know, in that. We're not going to like break down every little aspect and every little piece of everything. There's a few things we're going to talk about, but the, I don't want us to lose sight of what this is here for, you know? And so, uh, you know, maybe at another time we'll, t- we'll like look at each, each piece and just how each piece is just a revelation of uh, the Messiah and his work with us and to us and for us. But uh, we'll see a little bit of that tonight because I want to f- really focus on chapter 29. But we'll, we'll cover 28 a little bit and, and 30 a little bit. But I really want to focus on, I'm sorry, 28. And uh, when we're talking about uh, the, the high priest and just the different things that, that involves him. So, yeah. You ready to get into it? All right, well, let's start off with uh, setting it up for this purpose. Tetzaveh is the name of the portion. Now, when we started talking about the tabernacle, we see how, you know, Aaron was instructing, uh, Moses was instructing Aaron, Aaron was telling the people of uh, specific things that needed to be molded, fashioned, made, designed. Well, this one kind of starts off a little different. You know, it starts off with Tetzaveh, and you shall command Israel to bring something. It's not something that they you know, like made or fashioned or anything like that, but there was something that they were to do to bring. And so what was that? Again, so Tetzaveh, the name of the portion is from the word Zava. How many of you have heard mitzvot? Okay, mitzvot are the commands. Mitzvah is, a, is a, translated as a good deed, but it literally means command. Why would we translate a good deed as a command? Because as we're doing what God commanded us to do, we're doing good to one another. You know, so, so again, it's the mitzvah. It, it's a mitzvah. We are doing what God told us to do, and that is good, is the idea. So here God is commanding the people of Israel to bring something. And what is he commanding them to bring? Hmm. I mean, is this something that they don't have? Is this something that's not at their disposal? No. But there is a process that they need to do in order to bring something. You ever notice that God will ask you to bring something where it may be something that he's given you, but there's still you have some aspect of bringing it. You ever notice that? You know, like he'll impart to you a certain skill or even just knowledge or just certain things in your life. He'll, he'll bless you guys. Think about this, even in your jobs. It is God that has equipped you to do what you do, you know? And so how much more so when he says to use it for him, right? Okay. So what is he telling them to bring? Well, we read it. You are to order the, the people of Israel to bring pure oil of pounded olives for the light to keep the lamp burning continually. So Aaron and his sons are to put it in the tent of meeting outside the curtain in front of the testimony to keep it burning from evening until morning before Adonai. This is a permanent regulation through all the generations for the people of Israel. So they were supposed to bring pure olive oil that was supposed to go in the menorah that Aaron and his sons were supposed to go into the holy place and to keep the lamp burning on the menorah constantly. Okay, But what would happen if the people didn't bring the oil to Aaron and his sons so they could go give that oil to the menorah? The flame in the menorah, what would happen to it? Well, eventually it would go out. You know, it'll only burn so long and, and then it's used. It's gone. And so they, they, they have to bring the oil to Aaron and his son. So what's the process of the getting oil? I'm not going to go into the big process of how you get olive oil. You can talk to Paul about that. All right. But, but there is a process that needs to be gone through in getting the oil. Okay. Especially the oil that was used in the temple. I mean, think about it. There's certain degrees of olive oil. You have that very first press of the oil you know just a gentle squeeze and you get a drop of oil or you can pound it to a pulp into oblivion and then strain it out and then get some oil out of that way which oil do you think is going to be more pure 
the first press. See, if, if, the, if, the, if the olive would yield the oil at a gentle press, that's going to be the most pure oil, right? But if the oil doesn't come when it's pressed, then what happens? It's pressed a little harder. If you still don't get any oil, then it's pressed a little harder. If you still don't get any oil, it is pressed until you get oil, okay? <laughs> And so the idea is the degree of the oil that you get out of that olive depends on the press that needs to be applied. If you get the pieces and the chunks of the flesh of the olive in the oil, uh, hint, wink, nudge, okay? <laughs> if you get the chunks of the flesh in the press where the, where the oil, then you're going to have to strain those chunks of the flesh of the olive out to get that pure oil. But there's always going to be little remnants or pieces of, of the meat or the flesh of the olive in that oil. You hear me? How does that relate to us? You know, in the, in the first press, you know, you know, I, I, I would equate a press to something like, okay, maybe there's something that you know God has told you to do. And maybe you just don't want to do it. He might press a little more. You know? I think it would be safe to say Jonah was pressed. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of the idea. You know, if we, at the, at the gentle press, if we yield ourselves to the process, the result, it's more pure. And what's the result of a very pure oil? A pure flame. And a pure flame has less junk in it. You know? Because you, you see some flames and they're burning and there's just a lot of black smoke and it fills with just this black smoke and it's like, oh man, that's miserable. You're coughing and hacking. And then you see some flames that are burning and it's, a, it's clean. You don't get a lot of that soot and junk out of there. There is a difference. And so this is what he's saying. The, it's the pure that yields the lighter flame. And when we understand that it's supposed to be his light that is burning within us, that's supposed to be pure. And that's what's going to draw people. It's not, it's not uh, the big black smoke cloud that surrounds us that's going to draw people to us. It's going to be that, that pure light, that pure flame that burns within us. Right? Okay, I'm glad you agree. So, the oil for the menorah, we look at this. To get the oil, the olive has to be pressed. The oil provided the light for the flame. The result was a pure flame. So, again, the question is, are we willing to be pressed, or do we need to be crushed? Right? There's a difference. Either way, you're getting the oil. Either way, you're getting what you need, but there's a one way to, to get the result a lot cleaner and better and faster. Right? And we say, we're all, we're all learning, aren't we? Yeah, we're all learning. So we read in 2 Corinthians 4, it says, We have all kinds of troubles. We are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, yet not abandoned. Not down, but not destroyed. How many of you guys are singing right now? <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. You know, when, when, when we understand that when the things of life come, we, it doesn't have to knock us off our feet and pound us into the ground. Because we do have hope, right? Ephesians 5.8 says this, For you used to be what? Notice it didn't just say you used to be in darkness. It said you used to be darkness. I think we can all testify. You know, there was uh, things within us that was pretty dark, right? But what does it say about now? Okay, it says you used to be dark. But what are we now? So united with Yahweh, you are light so live like children of the light. For the fruit of the light is in every kind of goodness, rightness, and truth. Amen? All right, so the lamp that was supposed to be in there for the menorah was supposed to burn how? Say with me. Continually and perpetually. Does that sound kind of redundant to you? Why don't you just say always? It says continually and perpetually. You guys, there's two different words that are there in the Hebrew. For continually is the word Allah, where we get like the Ola offering, the same kind of thing. It's the word Allah, which means it's translated as to burn or to be continual or to go up or to ascend. Okay? So in other words, it's to burn continually and it's supposed to ascend continually and then perpetually is tamid. Tamid indicates daily. 
every day. So in other words, they would have to come in and they would have to tend to the flame every day to make sure that it is burning continually, right? See how they do really work together. They do go together there, okay? We see it this way. For the flames to burn, we have to make sure that we trim what? The wicks. First off, they cleaned the cups, and they made sure that the, that the oil was in there, that the wicks were in there, and that the wicks were the right length, the right material, the right type of what they needed. And, uh, and when you burn a wick, what do you get out of that wick? I mean, you get a wick that burns, and, and you ever see wicks that get like really long on a candle? And man, what happens then? It, it, you know, the flame gets really weird and you get all that black smoke. You get all that stuff. Well, if you trim that wick back to the length that it's supposed to be, get rid of the stuff that's burned away that's causing all that black stuff in the flame, you get a purer flame. Now, when you understand that they used to make the wicks from the priest's garments, the old garments that the priests had used, once they you know, were soiled, they couldn't be used anymore, they would cut them up and they would use them for the wicks. So think about this. The idea of that is the old things being burned away. The old things being continually trimmed out of our lives. So where each day when the priest would have to go in and have to would inspect the menorah, he would have to look to see, and it would remind him that the old covering, his old ways, his old thoughts, his old things of what he used to do, he would have to make sure that these are the things that he is daily cutting away in his life to allow that pure flame, that light of the Most High to burn within him. And think about it. You know, we've, we've said the menorah in, in, in Jewish literature is called the light of the world. And it was the only light that was in the holy place. When we come before the light of the world, how should we examine ourselves? Same way. To make sure that the wicks are trimmed, the old things are, we're cutting those things away from our life. And as we're coming to Him, we see Him, you know, in that purity there, in that He changes us, right? All right. Proverbs 4.18 says, The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, shining ever brighter until full daylight. But verse 19 says, The way of the wicked is like darkness, and they don't even know what makes them stumble. Think about this. You ever get up in the middle of the night, and you're tripping over stuff? Why? Because there's no light. <laughs> you're tripping over stuff. I mean, it's, how many times? This is my house. I know where everything is, and I'm still tripping over stuff, right? But why? Because there's no light. And so when we understand that it's that light that makes the way in our path, you know, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, and it's the word of God that directs that light on our path. If we don't have the light, we're going to constantly be tripping over stuff and hitting potholes and, and knocking ourselves down and... Think about it. How many times in our life, before we came to the Lord, before we came to know Him, before we repented, we can look back on that and say, you know, a lot of the stuff that I went through was just a plain old result of me not knowing what I was supposed to do. Well, that's what the Word does. It, it brings light to, the, to our life and to those situations to say, well, this is how you're supposed to do this. This is how you're supposed to handle that. We didn't know that. We were walking in darkness, so we tripped over things that we should have seen, but we didn't know, right? So it makes sense. So that's the idea of having that light within us constantly, right? Exodus 28. All right, 28. So this is what I said. We want to spend uh, most of the time here in Exodus 28 talking about uh, Aaron and his sons and, and the, the high priestly garments, the different things that are made for here because there's some really neat things that we see here, okay? First off, let's understand that the high priest, his very first duty behind b anything else was to minister to Yahweh. Okay? That was his responsibility, to minister to Yahweh. His second responsibility was to minister and to intercede for the people, okay? His first responsibility was to be in the presence of, of God and to do what he had asked to minister to him to do what he said to do, all right? In order to do this, in order to stand as a model of a high priest, there were certain things 
that he wore to represent what God wanted him to be. You know, and, and guys, this high priest, specifically Aaron, in this aspect, is kind of a model of Mashiach. I'm not going to say every high priest, but I will say Aaron, okay, is, is a, a shadow of the Messiah, Yeshua. And as far as him interceding for us, okay? So we're going to see some neat things here, all right? We see this, it says, make sacred garments for Aaron that are glorious and beautiful. Where it says sacred garments, Begde Kodesh. How many of you know what Kadosh is? Kadosh is holy. How many of you know what Begid is? Begid, like we just had Reuben Prager here, Begid Ivri, right? Begid is the garments, right? So, so Begde uh, Kodesh is holy garments. Okay, so to make holy garments for Aaron, and they're supposed to be beautiful, glorious, wonderful garments, right? We read it in the Hebrew, like Kvod. What's kavod? Glory. Glory, right? And uh, look, tiferet. Tiferet is, be- is beautiful. Okay? So it literally says to make garments for glory and beauty, or glory and splendor. And Aaron is supposed to put on glory and splendor when he stands to minister to bless the Father and to intercede for the people. See? And so, glory and splendor kind of alludes to a lot more than just, man, this is a pretty nice duds you got there, Aaron. Yeah. Right? So, what do they mean? And furthermore, who could make them? Did he just go in and say, okay, I know you're off in the wilderness, but I'm going to send you the best tailor in the land, and he's going to make these garments for you? No. There were specific people that God had wanted to do this from Israel to do so, and what were the requirements? We're going to see some of that, all right? You ready? Look at this. Isaiah 52, 1 says this. Put on your what? Priestly garments. This is the same phrase that was used describing Aaron's garments. We see it. It says this. Wake up, wake up, O Zion. Clothe yourself with strength. Put on your what? Beautiful clothes, O holy city of Jerusalem, for unclean and godless people will enter your gates no longer. Where it says your beautiful clothes, it's big day, tiferetech. It's the same phrase, the same words that, are, that was describing Aaron's garments. So when it says put on your beautiful clothes, it's not just nice garments. He's telling him to put on the priestly garments to receive the office of the priest. And that kind of makes a difference there, doesn't it? All right? So who was supposed to do these? Let's look. Speak to all the craftsmen to whom I have given the spirit of wisdom and have them make Aaron's garments to set him apart for me so that he can serve me in the office of Kohen. Notice it says, to whom I have given. That word for given is the, is the Hebrew melo which literally means to fill. So understand that the people who made Aaron's garments, God said he literally filled them with his spirit to equip them to make Aaron's garments. These were not just anyone who could make clothes well. These were people who were filled with the spirit of God to do so. And so, in other words, they had to have the right heart to do so. They had to have uh, a heart surrendered to the Father to want to do this. And they had to receive what the Father wanted them to do here. And they had to understand what they were making. That this was not just something that was nice, but this was something that was holy. And this was something that would represent them to the Most High. And so... They had to undertake that with the right heart, with the right attitude. You know? In other words, even their construction of it was a service to God and was an offering of themselves to Him in just even making these. There's no menial task when it comes to the kingdom, guys. Right? So the word skilled, if you look in the Webster's, it says having knowledge, but that's not it. Okay? Skill does not equal knowledge. What do I mean by that? You can know how to do something, but not know how to do something. (laughs) Sound familiar? 
You know, well, I read a book on it once. I know how to do that. Okay, have you had any real life application of the task? Makes a difference, doesn't it? <laughs> I see some of you guys working construction going, oh, yeah. <laughs> you ever have someone show up on the job, say, I can do anything? Yeah, they can't do anything. <laughs> right? See, it's not just knowing how to do something. It's actually being able to do something. See, you can read a manual on how to drive a car. Unless you get behind the wheel and learn how to drive a car, you don't know how to drive a car. So skill does not equal knowledge. Skill means you have knowledge of something and you know how to apply that knowledge to accomplish a task. That is skill. Okay? And so what God is saying is that he gave he, that these people who were making these garments, they didn't just have the know-how to do this, but they were skilled in it. They weren't just doing something that they knew how to do, but he was equipping them even for the purpose for what was being done. And it does read a little different, right? All right, Proverbs 2.6 says this. Adonai gives what? Wisdom. From his mouth comes what? Knowledge and understanding. Look at this next one. He stores up common sense for the upright. I think I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I'm not going to comment. I'm just going to pause. <laughs> just let you mull over that. Yeah, say la. <laughs> right, right. And then it says, he is a shield to those whose conduct is blameless in order to guard the courses of justice and preserve the way of those faithful to him. I want to point out that we have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. These three things, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, we find throughout the scripture is the testimony of somebody in whom is the Spirit of God. It's from the Torah all the way through the Brit Hadashah. We find that a marker, the testimony of someone having the Spirit of God in them, we see a testimony of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean they know everything. But it, it is said, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. All right, it's moving on. Verse 9, then you will understand righteousness, justice, fairness, and every good path. Again, we have wisdom will enter your heart. Knowledge will be enjoyable for you. Discretion will watch over you. And discernment, also known as understanding, will guard you. And they will save you from the way of evil and from those who speak deceitfully. What this means is that by the Spirit of God, He will lead us in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And that will help with our discernment too, won't it? How do we know what we're discerning is true or is accurate? Because, guys, that's what the Word is for, to teach us how to discern, and to teach us how to line up, right? And we see that testimony, wisdom, knowledge, understanding. The priesthood were mediators for Israel. They were the kind of the people who represented the nation to the Most High. Aaron did this as a one-on-one -on -one basis. And then we read, you know, a little later, we read that the Levites were given to Aaron and his sons to equip them to do what they needed to do. They were the mediators that got to go between to bring the people into the presence of the Most High. Again, we kind of have a, a shadow of what Yeshua had done for us. He, he, he is that mediator for us that brings us into the presence of the king, right? And so again, we just see there was something that had to set him apart. Well, what's being done here is they're making these garments for Aaron. Just these garments in and of themselves is going to set Aaron apart from anybody else because the priests wore the white linen garments. That's what they wore, just the plain white linen garments. But I guarantee when you looked in the courtyard, you could pick out Aaron. And understand that Aaron didn't go around town wearing these clothes. He wore these clothes when he ministered in the tabernacle. You know, when he was off duty, he'd go put on his civvies and go home, okay? He, he was, he was, when he was there and he was ministering, he would daily have to put on these garments. And then when he went to be among the people, he would have to 
let's just say, empty himself of his glory and splendor to go be with everybody else. Does that sound familiar? Right? We say this, the clothes caused the people to recognize the priests and the authority that they carried. So the one who makes the clothes had to be filled with the spirit that God had given them. And we see the testimony of that. And, and that is going to distinguish or set apart the priesthood in their service. Right? Exodus 31 says this, Adonai says to Moshe, I have singled out Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Again, we see wisdom, understanding, and knowledge of every kind of artis artis artisanry. And he is a master of design in gold, silver, bronze, cutting precious stones to be set, wood carving, and every other craft. Again, we see he, ha he had the skill in all these things, not just because, man, he was that good. No, but because God filled him with his spirit to equip him to do these things. Again, it's a testimony not of how good he was, but of how great God is. Right? Exodus 28.4. When we read the list of, of what they were to make, the very first piece that they were supposed to make for Aaron starts with what? The breastplate. The very first piece they were to make is the breastplate. Now, where did the breastplate go? Over the heart. It covered the heart of the matter, so to speak. The same thing with, the, with the, uh, the, the tabernacle itself. God said, make me a tabernacle. And what was the very first piece he told him to start with? The ark. The heart of the tabernacle. What was in the ark? The tablets of testimony that were made. So at the very heart of the tabernacle was the presence of God and His Word. Well, what we have here is that Aaron was to represent the people to the Most High, and so he has over his heart the names of Israel. They both represent the heart. The high priest, the mediator that is supposed to represent the people to the Father, when he goes before him, is to have the sons of Israel on his heart. How can you intercede for someone if you don't have them on your heart? See? And so when he comes before them, he has them. He carries them on his heart, literally, right? So the breastplate, we often call it breastplate. In the Hebrew, the word literally is Hoshen Mishpat. Hoshen Mishpat. And it's translated the breastplate of judgment. The breastplate of judgment. You know, uh, we covered a portion not that long ago called Mishpatim. And Mishpatim, they're judgments. These were the things that we read in the Scripture that deal with relationships, that deal with those day-to-day -day going in and out of things in our life. You know? Different situations, how we handle each other, how we deal with one another, how we confer with one another, when problems arise, how we deal with that. I mean, these are judgments, right? So Aaron, over his heart, carried the breastplate of judgment. Why? breastplate of judgment and on it had the names of Israel and had the people on his heart but yet it was judgment now guys don't forget I keep saying this and I want you guys to always remember this judgment's only bad if you're on the wrong side of it <laughs> when God judges it is just it is holy it is righteous it is good and it is true and when he judges it judge he judges the world and the ways of the world but for God's people it is deliverance and it is hope you know, when he judged Egypt, he brought his people out. When he judged the earth, Noah was brought out and redeemed, right? So we see how all this works together. So again, when Aaron would go, it's the breastplate of judgment. Well, how would he mean judgment? I mean, how, how would this work? Well, let's take a look at something. So Aaron will carry the names of the sons of Israel. We have up here on precious stones. When we read in 1 Peter, it says you are precious stones, right? On precious stones on the breastplate for judging over his heart when he enters the holy place as a continual reminder before Adonai. As a continual reminder. God is the one who judges with his people. 
God is the one who does these things. And it says that, that the, the breastplate is the span of a hand. You know, we can say roughly about 10 inches, but the span of a hand about like this, okay? And why would it be a span of a hand over the heart? <coughs> Isaiah says this, Behold, I have carved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are always before me. So as the, the size of a hand on the heart, he's touching the stones that represent the people, the precious stones that represent the people on which have their names engraved on them. Pretty cool, huh? About this. Aaron will carry the names of Israel on the breastplate for judging over his heart. When he enters the holy place, you are to put the Urim and the Tumim in the breastplate for judging, and they will be over Aaron's heart when he goes into the presence of Adonai. Thus, Aaron will always have the means for making decisions for the people of Israel over his heart when he is in the presence of Adonai. So we see that the breastplate for judging, there was something here that's called the Urim and the Tumim, and, it, and we don't know what it is, okay? Nobody does. It's all speculation because there's nothing in Scripture that defines what they were. Okay? All we know is what they were called and, and its function. They had a purpose. He said that they are to take the Urim and the Tumim and they are to put it in the breastplate for, for judging. What we read, when you really read through the whole thing, we always see the breastplate, this big chunk of gold, about like this, and with the stones set in. That's not the way it was. Okay? The breastplate itself was woven. Okay? It had gold thread in it, but it was woven. And then each stone was mounted on a gold backing. The, and then those gold backings were mounted on the breastplate. Then this breastplate piece was folded in half and made a pouch. The Urim and the Tumim were put inside this pouch. And so they, they would cover his heart. And so it says, so that Aaron will be able to, to make decisions. Again, there's that judgment part, the judging. To make decisions when he, when he goes in the presence of Adonai. Now, the phrase, the presence of Adonai, in regards to the tabernacle, literally means the holy place. Because when we see the holy place, not the holy of holies, the holy place, when we see it being constructed, the phrase before the Lord is continually used. So when we see the phrase before the Lord in regards to the tabernacle, it means the holy place. So Aaron would come into the holy place. He would have the Urim and the Tumim in this breastplate for judging and something Somehow, some way, it would, it would enable him to know what God was wanting him to know in regards to making decisions for the people of Israel. And that's about all we know from Scripture. There's a lot of speculation beyond that. There's a lot of stories. There's a lot of midrash. You know, the, the idea that they think that, that the breastplate for judgment and the Urim and Tum interacted with the menorah because they have something to do with light and that it would kind of let Aaron know what was to happen. But Urim and Tumim mean perfect light. Urim is or, light. Tumim, Tame, means perfect. So Urim and Tumim, to make the, the judgments that would be before the Lord for the people of Israel, was given by the perfect light in the holy place. Does that sound familiar to anybody? We read in John chapter 1. Yeah, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, but we kind of forget that one part in there where it says that He was the light that was in the beginning. And the light came into the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Still, speaking of Yeshua. Right? All right. So the light of complete truth is put over the heart, that has the breastplate of Mishpat, where do we read something else like this? Ephesians 6 tells us, Therefore, stand having the belt of truth buckled around your waist, put on righteousness for a breastplate. Righteousness, Zedek, and Mishpat always go hand in hand. Right? Righteous judgments. <laughs> okay? So put on your breastplate of righteousness. 
I really don't hold to the idea that Paul was just relating to a Roman soldier. I do believe that there was more he was relating to there, you know, especially when he's talking to people about standing. I think that, you know, when Paul says to the Romans, I spoke as a Roman, to the Jews, I spoke as, a, you know, to the Greeks, I spoke as a Greek. Now, Paul did not say, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, okay? But what he did say was to know who you're talking to and try to speak to them in a way that they'll understand what you're saying. Okay? Know your audience is what he was saying. Know who you're talking to. And so I do believe that there were things that he was saying to give them ways to relate, but I do believe we can also relate a lot of this to uh, Israel and the priestly garments as well. Look at this. Ezekiel 36, 26. So a new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you. Now here we have him putting his spirit in us, right? We just talked about that. And cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my mishpat and do them. So we see the connection, God putting his spirit in us and his mishpat. Where does he put his spirit within us? Our hearts. Where was the breastplate of mishpat? Over the heart. There's a connection between the heart and the mishpat. See? If you have a new heart, then there's going to be those mishpat there too. Right? In other words, having the Father's heart will mean walking in his spirit, meaning keeping his mishpatim. If we have his spirit in us, that it's his word we're going to want to keep, not our own, right? When we see when, uh, when Israel was exiled and then when they returned, we saw some really interesting things. One of it is this. Ezra says, The Tirsatha said to them, They should not eat of the most holy things, so there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. When they returned, let's just say records weren't very well, not kept very well when they were exiled, so when they returned, they really didn't know, I mean, Someone could say, hey, I'm a Levite, but they're like, yeah, prove it. You can't. They couldn't, okay? Not everyone was able to do so. So what they said is, okay, um, we'll let you have some responsibilities. We'll let you do some things, but you can't, like, take full position of the office until we know for certain that we can discern who you really are. So until someone who, who stands with the Urim and Tumim to make the decisions of this judgment, to judge this, uh, let's just play our cards safe. The idea is they didn't have them. Because if they had them, they could have used them. They weren't there. Okay? We read it in the same thing in, in Nehemiah, Nehemiah. In other words, even the Messiah would, and stories of the Messiah relate to this. You know, Midrashes and all these things say that when the Messiah comes, he will restore the Urim and Thummim. Well, who is he? <laughs> you know, so what they were saying in Ezra and Nehemiah were saying, okay, so until the, the priest arises or the high priest comes that has the Urim and the Tumim, we're just kind of do what we know to do, but he's going to set it all straight. Does that sound familiar? So what a lot of this, that's what a lot of the things about the Mashiach in uh, rabbinic literature come to say. Okay, we're not too certain on this, but when the Messiah comes, he's going to tell us, right? <laughs> I think when he comes, he'll, he says we will know as he knows. You know? We'll have a million questions. And we'll have plenty of time to have them answered. <laughs> right? Back to Exodus. It says, Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and six remaining names on the other in the order of their birth, an engraver should engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones as he would engrave a seal, mount the stones in gold settings, and put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the vest of the stones, calling to mind the sons of Israel. Aaron is to carry their names before Adonai and the two shoulders as a reminder. Again, he's bearing the weight of the sons of Israel on his shoulders. When you think about putting the weight on the shoulders, we think of bearing a burden. Okay, again, it's the idea of intercession. And it's kind of interesting, too, where it talks about two stones being engraved, and their shohim stones, the word shohim is a, is a sheen, hey, and a, and a mem. 
If you switch them around, they'll say Moshe, who engraved two stones for us. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of one of those little interesting side notes, right? Okay, so we see the two stones, take two show him stones. Two stones, what do I think of when we think of two? Two witnesses, two tablets, right? The two tablets are called testimony or witness. The two tablets of testimony, right? And then they're put in the ark. Then the ark is called the ark of testimony. The Shoham stones were to bear witness of the tribes on the shoulders of the priest. And they hold together the breastplate. They hold it to the ephod and they hold it all together, right? The two Shoham stones have six tribes on each stone. What's six? Man. Right, so representing man being the, the man being born on the shoulders of the high priest, as he goes before. There are 25 letters on each stone. If you were to write 25, like we say, like on a calendar, it's the 25th day of the month, right? They they would often use Hebrew letters to do that. 20 would be a kaf, and the five would be a chet. So though it spells a word. The word is koach. Koach means strength. To be firm. Might, power. And so it is to bear the strength or to be firm for man on his shoulders. There's more. Who do we know who represents a priest who will be firm on his shoulders? We see the Messiah when it talks about Yeshua. What does it say in Isaiah? Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his. There you go. You got it. Right? Even how it explains it, his name will be called Wonderful. It's the same word for wonderful. It's the same word that's used like for the garments, for Aaron's garments. Uh, you see, it, it all ties together, guys. It all points to him, doesn't it? All right. So, six of their names on one stone. When we write six of their names on one stone, it's, it's uh, Shisha. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mishmotam Al. Shisha Mishmotam Al. So that's the six names on. See something interesting. If you take the first letter of each of this phrase, when it says write six names on, it's a Shin Mem Ein. What's Shin Mem Ein? Shema. It's the Shema. And so these two stones were to be a witness or a testimony that he bears the, the, the weight or the firmness of Israel on his shoulders and the Shema calls us to do the same. To bear witness to the fact that he is our God. He is the one and only. He is the one we serve and we will testify to that fact. We look at it, the very first phrase of the Shema has six Hebrew words, 25 letters. On one stone is six words, 25 letters. It says Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. And in the scrolls, it is written as you see it, where you have the Ein and the Dalit are large, and the Ein and the Dalit together form the word Ed, which means testimony, witness, congregation. And so what it's calling us to bear witness and to testify to the fact that He is our God. He is the one we listen to. He is the one we serve. And we stand on His strength, His authority, His might, not our own. Right? Now what about this? The prayer ends, Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Vayed. Six words, 25 letters. You don't see that in the Hebrew. It's not that way in the English. It's, right? Six words, 25 letters. Six words, 25 letters. Shema Israel, Adonai Lehev, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Mahut Oleilam Vahed. Pretty cool, huh? Exodus 28, 31 says this. You are to make the robe for the ritual vest entirely of blue. Now this isn't just any blue. What kind of blue is this? Tehelet. What blue is Tehelet? Well, we, we see. It's the blue, that's the same blue that's in the seat seat. It's the Tehelet. In other words, when we see the seat seat, what does Scripture tell us? That you are to see it, and it is to remind you not to follow your own heart, your own desires, your own ways, but you are to follow Yahweh. 
You're to keep his word, right? And so when you look at them, you see, and it is to remind you that you were supposed to keep his word. Now, this is just this. The high priest's robe was entirely to hell it. <laughs> he was covered with the idea and the thought that he represents somebody else, not himself. Right? It says, so on its bottom hem, make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet, and put them all the way around with gold bells, and between them all the way around. Aaron is to wear it when he ministers, and it is to sound and be heard whenever he enters. Where? The holy place. So that he won't die. Now, we've seen the pictures of Aaron standing before the Ark of the Covenant in his high priestly garment, his high priestly outfits, sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat. I've seen some pretty awesome pictures, great workmanship you know i mean art wow you know the only problem is it never happened <laughs> when we read leviticus chapter 16 we see that when aaron went behind the curtain into the most holy place in front of the ark he was to wear the plain white linen garments and even we see here when these things were being created and when they were being made it says that he was to wear these so when he ministers wear holy place in the holy place at the table of showbread it had the menorah and and it had the altar of incense this is where he was supposed to be wearing this he wore it in the courtyard he would wear it right here when he ministers to the lord but when he went into the most holy place he had to wear the plain white linen garments before he could come before the lord as the intercessor for the people he had to empty himself of glory and splendor and present himself as a man Sound familiar? Traditionally, the all blue to hell it, the robe, is to remind us to be careful of evil speech. How in the world could the robe remind us to be careful of evil speech? Well, let me walk you through the process, all right? The whole robe is to hell it. In the Talmud, it compares Tehillah to the sea. Now, we've seen this. compares Tehillah to the sea. And then, you know, you've, you, we've heard Reuben Hispel, right? Well, what, what is Tehillah? Well, it's the color of the sea. Well, what color is that? Well, it's the color of the sky. Well, what color is that? It's the color of God's sapphire throne. Okay? So we start with the sea, right? So what color is Tehillah? Well, it's, it's the color of the sea. So how does the sea teach us to be careful of evil speech? You read this. The idea is the waves come in. How? With force. They can come in strong, but they break on the shore and they lose strength. Right? Even a tidal wave can only go so far. <laughs> right? So even the strongest of waves can only come so far. The idea is no matter how strong the wave is, there's a point where it breaks and it stops. Right? Okay, look at this. Job 38 says, so in break up for it, my decreed place and set bars and doors and said, Hitherto ye shall come, but no further. And here shall thy proud waves be stayed. So when it speaks of the ocean, there were boundaries for the ocean. It says, you can come to this place, ad po. You can come to this place and no further. Okay? So again, we have the idea of ad po. Right here, you come, and you don't come any further. And this is what was spoken to the ocean and to the waves. So po is here. Spelled the same way, though, as pay. What's pay? Mouth. Hmm. So we can relate this place to our mouth. We have this. Do not let these strong flowing words come out of your mouth. Cause them to break and lose strength before coming forth. There's more. Okay? Exodus 28.32 says, It shall have a binding of woven work around the whole of it. You know what it's saying? All this is saying is that around the neck holder, around the hole, the place where you put your head, right? There is a binding of woven work around it. And we think it's just like, just some practical thing, just to keep it from tearing or ripping or anything like that. Right? Wrong. The Hebrew reads this. Safe yehi lafiv safiv which can also read, there should be lips to your mouth. <laughs> what does that mean? 
We should use the bar and doors to prevent our tongue from bursting out and speaking unnecessary or negative words. So when they put this on, right here, even if he looks down, he is to see these. What is this binding work right here? And to remind him of be careful of the things that he says. Pretty neat picture, isn't it? Back to Exodus 28. You were to make an ornament of pure gold and engrave on it uh, as a seal set apart for Adonai, Kodesh le Yahweh. Fasten it to the turban with the blue cord on the front of the turban over Aaron's forehead because Aaron bears the guilt for any errors committed by the people of Israel in consecrating their holy gifts. Guys, Aaron wore this gold plate on the front of his head. It said, holy to the Lord. Can you imagine Aaron's neighbor being upset because his dog really got loose again, tore up my tent. I'm going to go tell Aaron to come home and get his dog. He goes to Aaron, and as he approaches him to yell at him, first thing he sees is plastered right across his forehead, holy to the Lord. How do you think he would approach him from that point? I think the idea is when we looked at him, we were supposed to see that he was set apart to Yahweh. That was not just something he did. That was who he was. And I think if we could take it one step further to where if we could see that in each other, we would treat each other a little differently as well. If we could truly see, you know, we have holy to the Lord <laughs> set upon us. And if we truly looked at each other that way, I think we might actually live a little differently. We agree? So in chapter 28, Aaron was declared, Aaron himself, not just his garments, Aaron was declared Kodesh le Yahweh, holy to Yahweh, right? Chapter 29, the altar was declared Kodesh Kodeshim, Kodesh Kodeshim. It's translated as Holy of Holies. And we think, when we say Holy of Holies, how many of y'all just think that little room that's in the back of the tabernacle? But it's not just that room that was called Holy of Holies. There were other things in regards to the tabernacle that were called Holy of Holies. And the idea is all these things are connected to bring us to that place. So think about this. Not too many people that we know would really start making railing accusations and saying negative and stupid things about the holy of holies, the most holy place, the place where God dwelled and resided himself. But how many people would speak and rail against the altar? You, you see what I'm saying? When God set them apart and consecrated them, he called them the same thing. So I think... We need to be careful about what we say about what God called holy. Amen. Right? If we understand it or not, it doesn't change the fact that God said it's holy. And so if we don't understand something that God called holy, I think it would be best for us to just follow the advice that we just read a little bit ago and just kind of like keep our mouth a little shut. You think? What do we see in chapter 30? The incense altar was called Kodesh Kadashim. Truly, we see how these things were connected. The altar and the altar, the altar that was out there and the altar of incense that went together to lead into the most holy place. And so it was a progression of bringing them into the presence of the Father. Kind of giving us this idea that when we start in the courtyard, every single day we're to come before him. Every single day we need to dedicate ourselves. Every single day we need to, to, to go and look to the most holy place. Every single day we need to come and present ourselves and bring ourselves to Him. To stoke the flame, to stoke the fire, to present ourselves to the Father, to bring our offering of who we are to Him and, and to be brought into His presence, you know, in, in, in our prayers, in the incense altar, and just, just to go into that place and just to be there. Guys, every day. Because... How many of y'all are like me, you know? Once you sleep, you kind of forget stuff. 
<laughs> you kind of need a to-do list for the day when you get up. Oh man, I was supposed to do this yesterday, right? Exodus 19.6 says, And you will be a kingdom of Kohanim for me, a nation set apart. These are the words you are to speak to the people of Israel. Peter says, You are a chosen people, the king's Kohanim, a holy nation, a people for God to possess. Why? In order for you to declare the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Revelation says, He has called you to be a kingdom, that is, Kohanim for God his Father. To him be the glory and the rulership forever and ever. Amen. So Moses sets the priests apart. He consecrates them. He, he gets them ready for service. This is their ordination, so to speak. Okay? And in doing so, they have an ordination. It's, it's called an ordination ram or the ram of consecration. I'm not going to really say a lot about it other than the name is interesting. Okay? It's a ma'el ameluim. Now, ale, it was, uh, the idea is it's translated as the goat, but it means strength. Okay, and so the goat, hamiluim, that's the word consecrate, but it literally means to fill them. When God was setting them in position for their service, their ordination, so to speak, was God filling them and equipping them for what he called them to do. And so we see that in their being set into place. He wasn't just calling them to do something and then hoping to get it right. He was equipping them for the task. I think, I think we can take, uh, take that well in our lives too, that if the Father has called us to do something, then He's the one who's going to equip us to carry it through. Amen? So after He sets them apart, He anoints them with, you want to guess? Oil! Right? But what kind of oil? It says, Shemin HaMoshiach. Shemin HaMoshiach. The oil of Messiah. Or it's literally translated the oil of anointing. Okay? Mashak is the word to anoint. Moshiach means anointed one. You know? That's why they translate it as Christos, Christ, the anointed one. That's what we're saying. Moshiach is anointed one. And so Shemin HaMoshiach Kind of funny how it translates the oil of Messiah. <laughs> so he, he consecrates them and he sets them apart and then they apply the, the oil where? Right ear, right thumb, big toe. I'll make this short. Why the right ear? So that the things that they hear, may those things be the anointed things. May those things, may their hearing be anointed. May their hearing be clear. May their hearing be the things that they need to hear to discern. Their, their thumb, may the work of their hands, the things that they do, be set to the things of the Messiah, be set to the things of God. And, and why their right big toe? You ever try to walk without a big toe? It's a little difficult. So what we're saying is their halakha their walk and their going about of their daily things, their, their routine, how they walk their daily life. May these things be glory to the Messiah. Okay? Now, see a little more. After Aaron was set apart, he kind of goes from being called, hey Aaron, Moses' brother, to what? High priest. Wrong. <laughs> now, in some places, he is called high priest, but that's not what it says here. It's kind of translated as high priest. You know, Kohen Hagadol, high priest. When he was anointed and set apart and consecrated for service, he was called Hakohen HaMashiach, the priest, the Messiah. And that's why I say, Aaron is a symbol or a type of Yeshua, a type of the Messiah. Every other priest that existed from that point, especially like in the Second Temple era, was called Kohen HaGadol. Aaron was the one that was called Kohen HaMashiach. And so he was a picture, a shadow of the work of the Messiah and what he would come to do. Pretty neat when you, when you, you know, see things like that, that you you know, you see it in the Hebrew, but you don't really see it in, in the English texts, right? 
So through all your generations, this is to be the regular burnt offering. What offerings? One in the morning and one in the evening at the entrance to the tent of meeting before Adonai. There is where I will meet with you and speak with you. There I will meet with the people of Israel and the place will be consecrated for my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Likewise, I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me in the office of Cohen. What we see here is that that at the, there at the door, at the tent, well, what's right there at the door of the tent? Well, right inside the door is the altar. And so they would, have, uh, they would put a lamb uh, every morning and a lamb every evening. The lamb in the morning would burn all day till it was consumed, till it was gone, and all the other offerings for the day, that would be the first one put on there for the day, and then all the other ones would go on or around or whatever. And then at the end of the day, this would be the last one on, and it would burn during the night till it was consumed and gone. Every morning, every night, there would be an offering that was presented to the Lord. Okay? Side note that you might find interesting. Okay? We'll, we'll get to that in a second. These were to given that it says, Then I will what? Live with the people of Israel. God said that it is there I will meet with the people of Israel. Now, what responsibility did they have beyond the altar? None. The people of Israel, when they came and they brought of their offerings and they gave it to the priest, and, and sometimes they would help the priest you know, do things with the offering, but once it went up there on the altar, that was their responsibility. There were certain portions of offerings that they got back, but they didn't go past the altar. It was the priest that took them, kind of by proxy, so to speak, and bring them into the presence of the Most High by what they did, not by what the people did. He would even have this in Yom Kippur when Aaron would represent the entire nation before the Lord in the, in the Holy of Holies. Isn't it good to know that it's not in your work that you go into the presence of the Father, but it is the Messiah that brings you to Him? Okay? And He says, it is there that I will live with the people of Israel. God said He will meet you at the altar. And it is there where He will live with you. Literally within you. What does it mean when you come to the altar? It means you're coming with the heart to where if need be, it's not just that offering you're putting on it. If need be, you'd put yourself on it. Kind of Romans 12, 1 and 2. And once we give of ourselves, we repent and we come to the Father, the priests bring us into His presence. And that's what Messiah did for us. Right? Alright. It's these offerings that the Anna Messiah will stop. We read in Daniel where he talk about the morning and the evening offerings. The lamb in the morning and the lamb in the evening. Daniel testifies of the fact that it is these offerings that the Antichrist, that the Anti-Messiah will stop. But there's no altar in Jerusalem. Yes, there is. It's not where it should be, and it's not in use, but it's there. Think about it, guys. What was the idea with the morning and the evening offerings? God said, it is here where I will meet with you. The anti-Messiah doesn't want him to meet with us. And so even the idea of laying ourselves down and giving of ourselves to him, he doesn't want. He's going to try anything he can to cut off every aspect of that. Whether it's us personally or even a remembrance of it. Think about it. What is a desire for the Father? That we have His fire in our life. We have His light. That we lay ourselves down to Him. What does Yahweh desire for us? Guys, who lit the altar? We read with the story of when the fire was lit on the altar. Who lit it? God did. We see that fire came out from before the Lord and lit the altar. That's not any fire that man created. God Himself lit that altar. And so it's His fire that we're supposed to take off that altar and to have with us in our hearts and in our lives daily. And it's then that we can take that next step 
The next thing we read in chapter 30 is about the altar of incense. And we read that the incense represents the prayers of the people of God. Guys, if our prayers are to be holy to the Lord, we first need to lay our lives down at that altar. And then we can offer ourselves to Him. And then our prayers will be received. Amen? Keep that fire burning. and Keep it lit. Amen? Well, if this teaching has blessed you, I want you to check out our other resources. You can check out our website at www.ruachonline.com. And there's links there to other resources that are available to you, other teachings, other books, other offerings. Uh, you can go to YouTube, Facebook, all of these things from our website. And uh, check us out, because if they enjoyed this teaching, there's going to be much more that hopefully will bless you as well. Thank you. Hi, this is Dr. David Jones from Ruach Ministries International, and I've got some exciting news for you. We have a new series coming out, six-part series of the Gospel according to Abraham. Abraham? What does he got to do with the Gospel? Well, you're going to have to find out, aren't you? The thing is, Galatians 3 says that the Gospel was proclaimed to Abraham. So what does that mean for a believer today? What does that mean to a person who is not Jewish? What does that mean to a person who is Jewish? What does that mean for all of us today? Well, check it out. It's a good series and it'll be coming your way soon. For more information, you can check out our website at www.ruachonline.com. Hi, this is Dr. David Jones here. I just want to say we do have some other resources available to you, one of which is a book entitled Famine, Walking and Blessing in the Time of Famine. It's based out of Amos 8, 11, and 12, talking about there's a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. So what is that famine? Does it mean the word of the Lord is not being proclaimed, or does it mean there's a famine of actually listening to it? Hmm. Food for thought, isn't it? Well, if you want to know more, check it out. Go to www.ruachonline.com and there's a link on our homepage. Just click and it'll take you for more information on the book entitled Famine, Walking in Blessing in a Time of Famine. Well, how important are the feasts of the Lord? I think we can say that if the Lord set out a banquet, set out a table and invited you to come be a partaker, would we answer? Would we hear? Would we go? Or would we blow them off because we have something more important to do? Well, that's what this book is. The king invites you to his table. Are we going to answer the call? The feast of the Lord, appointed times where the Lord has said he wants to meet with us face to face. Will we heed? Will we answer? Will we go? Check it out, www.ruachonline.com. On the homepage, there is a link to take you for more information. The King invites you to his table.